Hallelujah. Let's have our confession with the Bible. Say, this is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart's receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this, I said for this, is God's Word speaking to me, and I'm going to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. I think I saw Johnny Keith. That's you right there, Johnny. Good to see you this morning. Appreciate you, brother. We had a memorial service for his wife Thursday. And uh, we just want to tell you, we continue to pray for you. And uh, they've been a member of our church since 2008, and she had dealt with some issues later in life. But God is still God. Amen. Well, this morning I have an assignment, and I know it's an assignment from the Holy Spirit. And we touched on a little bit of this Wednesday night. And um, if I get to it, we'll... we'll review a little bit of that, but I, I've got an assignment this morning, and I'm going to get started on, we're going to go to your Bibles. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Psalms 91. And I assume most of you, if not all of you, you, uh, you have some type of insurance policy. Um, car insurance, homeowner's insurance, life insurance, and you should have all three of those policies. But anyway, so you're familiar with insurance. And, you know, insurance enables you, or I should say, enable, insurance entitles you for protection. It entitles you for care and protection over what you have insurance for. Is that not right? If something was to happen to your house, um, uh, maybe a, a flood in your house, a pipe busted or something, you would call the insurance company. And you're entitled to that coverage that protects you from having to put money out of your pocket, Right? So I want you to keep that in mind this morning as, we, as the message goes forth is what kind of coverage you have as a born-again Christian. And um, it's going to tie in. I'm going to let you connect your own dots this morning. But um, we can, uh, being we have insurance, we have access to certain types of coverage in our policy. So being a born-again Christian, you have access to certain types of coverage in your policy. Are you with me this morning? So let's turn, turn to Psalms 91, and while we're doing that, this is the assurance of God's protection. Psalms 91 is the assurance of God's protection. These are blessings, promises, benefits that belong to us, those who are a child of God. How many children of God we have in the service this morning? They are the most powerful scriptures that signify what God's will and protection is for our lives. So I want to encourage you today... Not just hear the words, not just memorize the words, not just read the words, but in order for the words to be manifested in your life, you have to do your part and sow the word. You have to impart the word in your spirit. And you have to sow it on good ground. It makes a difference what kind of ground you sow it on. You can't sow it on a ground of bitterness, strife, and jealousy. You've got to sow it on good ground. Are you with me? So let's look at, before we get started, Matthew, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Before we get into Psalms 91, I'm sorry. It says, Matthew chapter 13 and 23, it says, But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Notice here that not all believers are equally productive or equally fruitful. Are you with me? Didn't it say some 30, some 60, some 100 fold? So they're not, all believers are not equally productive or they don't produce equally the fruit. Why? Because who determines the proportion of the abundance of your fruit? Who determines the proportion of the abundance of your fruit? You, you do. I said, you do. Amen? Yeah. 
how you hear the word, how you accept the word, and how, and how you obey the word is going to be determined how the word produces for you. So it's your responsible to produce the word that comes forth. That means your heart has to be receptive to produce it. Mark, tw Mark 4, 24 says, take heed what you hear. With the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. I did a message on that one time. With the measure you use the word, the time, the energy, the effort you put into the word, and how you sow the word is how it's going to produce for you. Are you with me? So let's go to Psalms 91. Let's get into this this morning. God has been showing me some things. It says, he who dwells, I'm going to read probably down to verse 12 or 13, and then we're going to come back and break it down. But he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, or of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Now keep in mind here, let me just say this. The key to verse 2 through 16 working in your life falls being obedient to verse 1. We'll come back to that. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What are the benefits to abiding under the shadow of the mighty? Here we go, starting in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Verse 3. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. We know that the fowler is one who traps birds. So the enemy is going to make sure that he's going to throw traps at you. But thank God you can be delivered from each and every trap that the devil throws at you. I said I won't break it down. Anyway, verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the error that flies by day. Verse 6, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. Pestilence, we know, is sickness and diseases. COVID-19 falls under the uh, word pestilence. Nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side. And ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come near you. That's talking about death and destruction there. Verse 8. Only with your eyes shall you look. Wednesday night, I, I, I did break that down. I was talking about that means only with your eyes you shall look. That means destruction can happen all around you. On your right side, on your left side, on your right hand, on your left hand, all around you. But all you're going to do is be a spectator. You don't have to be a participator. All you're going to do is see, but you don't have to be, you don't have to participate in it. Amen? Amen. And you, and see the reward of the wicked, verse 8. And only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is your refuge, here we go again, he's repeating it, even the most high your dwelling place. Because you made the most high your dwelling place. Because you dwell in the secret place of the most high. For he shall give his angels... Charge over you. You notice he didn't say he shall give an angel charge over you. He said he shall give his angels charge over you. To keep you in all your ways. In their hands that shall bear you up. Talking about the angels. They support you. Lest you dash your feet against the stone. In verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. That means you shall conquer every lion, every cobra, every serpent that comes your way. You have the victory over it. Are you with me this morning? Yes. Let's go back and let's get this thing broken down this morning. And I'm telling you, I don't know if I'm going to get out of verse 1, but let's start with here. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That means when you abide under the shadow of the mighty, you live under the promises of God's protection. You live under the promise of God's protection when you abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
and when you dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Understand, like I said before, verses 2 through 16 are the fruit of verse 1. In order for verses 2 through 16 to be revealed in your life, you have to conquer verse 1. You have to, you, you have to conquer. Ver, the words associated with conquer are subdue it. You've got to subdue verse 1. You have to control verse 1. You have to succeed verse 1. You have to overcome verse 1. Oh, verse 1 has to be part of your life. It has to be your life. Not only part of your life, it has to be your life. Are you with me? The condition of being a doer of verse 1 qualifies you to receive all the promises in verse 2 through 16. Every benefit, every promise that we just talked about belongs to you as long as you make verse 1 your lifestyle. Dwells. He who dwells in the secret place. Dwells means to make one's home. It means to stay. It means to make one's home, to stay, remain, to rest in it. Don't, I want you to let that soak in now. To rest in the dwelling place, to occupy, to reside, to live in, or be an inhabitant of. How many of you inhabitant of the kingdom? Yeah, it was about half of you. We'll get the rest of you before the service is over. <laughs> I was watching a documentary this past week. I didn't get a chance to see the whole thing. And uh, sometimes, you know, you're flipping through. And so I was watching a documentary on, there was a, uh, a wealthy, really wealthy, an American. I don't know what his, I can't remember his name. He had teamed up with the government of Africa. And they had come together, there was a, portion of Africa, a large portion of Africa that had taken a big hit in the animal kingdom, in their land, the uh, poachers and the hunters and all. They had demolished a lot of the animals and it was like a lot of them were, you know, wouldn't surviving and they was like only under a hundred of animals in each species that were surviving and all. But this guy teamed up with them and they, and they made some, of course, some laws and changes of the land and they brought in they shipped in millions of dollars probably worth of animals. I'm talking about elephants, big cats, lions, tigers, antelope, water buffalo. I mean, they went on and on about how much they brought in, how, much, how, much, how many animals they brought in. And it wasn't very long. This was, I think, back in the late 80s and 90s area, time frame where this started. But, you know, they were talking about how the, the land has thrived and prospered in this today because of... The, the, the animals that were brought in. In other words, the point I'm trying to get you to make is these animals were brought to a dwelling place where they were able to thrive. They were able to prosper. The abundance of the land took off. Even the plants and trees started producing because these animals were brought into a place they were able to dwell safely in and of course they reproduced and multiplied. And to this day, there's more animals in that area than it ever has been. So the secret is to dwell in a place that creates an environment for you to prosper. It creates an atmosphere for you to succeed. So the secret to succeeding is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. First of all, we see that God has a secret place. Let's go to Psalms 27, verse 5. Psalms 27, verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble, this is David speaking, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So we see that there is a secret place. The verse 27 in uh, chapter 27, verse 5, in the Message Bible, I don't know if they have it on the screen, but in the Message Bible, it says, that's the only quiet, secure place in a noisy world. The perfect getaway, far from the buzz of traffic. 
Keep the noise out. You've heard me say that many times. Keep the stuff out. Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, you got to keep it out. Because it influences not only what you hear, but it changes your perspective. If you, let me ask you this. How many have dwelt, don't raise your hand. <laughs> have you dwelt more on the current events this week or you have dwelt in the secret place? this week of the Most High God. Think about that. What have you dwelt more on? Have you, have, you, have you inhaled and listened to bad news after bad news? Current events, news media, whatever. Facebook. I know my wife will let me talk about Facebook, but Facebook, there's, there's some good, there is good in Facebook, I promise you. There's some good things on Facebook. But I'm talking about the bad things on Facebook. Don't, don't be drawn to that kind of stuff because it changes your perspective. Because if you're constantly seeing what's wrong with the world, then it's going to have an effect on your spiritual life. So look at, don't look at the, don't, let me say it this way, don't look at the world through the lens of the world. Even Christians look at the world through the lens of the world. They shouldn't do that. But you should look at the, you should look at the world through the lens of the, and confidence of Almighty God. Are you with me? It's okay to know what to pray about, but don't be consumed about every little negative thing that's happening in Hampton and Newport News, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, whatever. Don't be consumed by it, because my God is greater than anything in this world. Let me move on. Hallelujah. David portrays that the secret place of the Most High is in his presence. The Most High. We talked about the Most High Wednesday night. Most High means there is no threat greater. It didn't say upon the high. It said the Most High. Somebody didn't get it. Let's go. Psalms 31.20. David says this. You shall hide them in the secret place of your what? Y'all ain't there yet? It means of your presence. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the plots of men, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion for the strife of tongues. What I got out of this is, with the covering of his presence, you shall be hidden from the enemy. That means, with the, in the covering of his presence, the enemy shouldn't be able to find you. He shall hide them in the secret place of his presence. There is something special about being in his presence. God's hiding place is in his presence where we should live. And those who live or those who dwell there shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Abide means to remain in. Abide means to stay in. Abide means to continue in. To continue in his presence. It also means to submit. Abide means to submit. To submit means to yield to or yield to the power and authority of Almighty God. That means you got to trust God with your whole heart. It don't matter what's going on in this world. You got to keep trusting God with your whole heart. We've seen that signs in. On, on signs in yards and things in front of people's houses, on, or even bumper stickers. No matter what, trust God. Yes. Next time you see that sign, you're going to think about this message. No matter what, trust God. Okay, it says that we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. A shadow is a metaphor used for care and protection. When you're in the shadow of someone or to be in someone's shadow, you have to remain close to them. Is that not true? To be in someone's shadow, you've got to be real close to that person. So that's what it's talking about. We gotta, we, so we'll be in the shadow of the Almighty. When we are in the shadow of the Almighty, it gives us peace. It gives us comfort. It gives us protection, care. Or whatever we're going through, or whatever, or whatever, whatever life challenges that has for you, we are to remain in the shadow of of the Almighty. Are you with me? 
when we are in the shadow of the Almighty, he will, when we're there, He will not put anything on us that we're not able to bear it. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. That means God is supervising your temptations. Does it not? That means he's aware of your temptations. He's supervising your temptations. Then it says, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It didn't say remove it completely. It says that you'll be able to bear it. Your strength comes from the Father. Your strength comes from this word implanted in your spirit. Amen? And when we go through it, we're not bearing it alone. You're not going to have to do it by yourself. Being in his shadow means that he is there with us. As long as we're in the shadow of the Almighty, you'll not have to face it by yourself. It may seem like you by yourself, but you've got to remember where you're at. You've got to remember where the environment it is. You're in the shadow of the Almighty. But sadly, unfortunately, there are Christians who don't know or know very little about being in the secret place. Being in the secret place of the Most High and what it is to abide under His shadow. Every child of God wants all the benefits. They want all the blessings. They want all the promises. Yet they do not dwell in the secret place of the Most High. They run to it at times. Or even enjoy some occasional visits. <laughs> on Sunday mornings. No. <laughs> Wednesday night. But it's a difference in, in being in the shadow of the Almighty. It's a difference in living in the shadow of the Almighty. And it's a difference in visiting the shadow of the Almighty. But we have to habitually and continually reside in His presence. If you want to develop a vibrant relationship with the Lord, then we need to learn to dwell in the secret place of God. The secret place is simply a life of continual fellowship with the Father. Jesus himself addressed the secret place when he was delivering the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6 says... And when you pray, this is Jesus talking about. Jesus said this, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets. He was talking about being openly praying to draw attention to themselves. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogue and on the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. Now this is Jesus teaching. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, who is in the what? Who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's a good time to shout right there. Hallelujah. I'm not telling you that the secret place is only praying in your bedroom. Of course, you can't live in your bedroom all the time. But, and that wasn't the point that Jesus was making. Jesus' main point was not being alone in your bedroom every time you pray. But his point was, now we should get alone and spend time with the Father. Don't get me wrong, we should get alone and spend time with Him. We should pray in the, in, in, when by ourselves. But his point was more about developing a life of prayer without the motivation of being seen by other people. That's what he was talking about. Amen? I know about you, but I'm going to increase my prayer time. How about you? 
Prayer changes things. I said prayer changes things. Hallelujah. That story just come to me. You got, you got time to share that? About Brandon, when you pray, you don't want to do that? Real quick, can you do that? I, I just came to me, and I just want to obey the Holy Spirit real quick. It's not, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> she didn't know. Okay, um, we have a younger son, Brandon, and he was Tuesday morning, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep, so I just started praying. And um, you kind of have to know some background about my son, Brandon. He's great. He's fantastic. But he's not serving God the way he knows he should serve God, right? So he's running a little bit, just like his daddy did. Okay? And you see where he's at, right? And you see where my older son's at, right? So he's coming along. You wanted me to tell the story. So, right, <laughs> right. So um, I was, look, look, it's not the first time I prayed for him. Like both of my kids, you know, us moms, we spend a lot of time on our knees for our kids. And um, some of them come in faster than other ones do. But he's coming in. Um, and so he kind of gets tired of me talking to him about things of the Lord, you know. He loves God. And if he comes to this church, he's going to be at the altar because he can feel the presence of God every time he comes in. But he's just running. Um, so this is highly unusual. I am... After I finish praying, we're headed to church that morning, and I get a text message from my son. Randall, what's the name of the song? When I Think of You. I Thought You Should Know. Yeah. When, and, and he texted me, I Thought You Should Know, Morgan, somebody. It's a country song. So I said, is that a song? And he said, yeah, when I hear it, it makes me think of you. Well, of course, I had heard it before because my older son had said the same thing, but I played it again and was reminded that the words in the song talk about how your prayers for me have not fell on, have not been in vain and have not fell on deaf ears. Of course, you know, now I'm crying so hard I can't even come in to, into work. Um, but it was a message from God saying, I'm hearing your prayers. Brandon doesn't even know the confirmation that he gave me about prayers for his life. But don't give up on your kids. God's, God's listening. Amen. That come back to bite me, didn't it? Anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. I guess the moral of the story is prayer works. Stay in the secret place of the Most High. Hallelujah. I'm here today because they stayed in the secret place of the Most High. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, now we've got to get back into anointing. <laughs> to dwell in the secret place means to live a place of continually drawing closer or nearer to the Father. Maybe you're here today and it seems like your blessings are being held up. The promises hadn't been manifested in your life. The manifestation of your healing has not yet taken place. Maybe you're dealing with fear, depression. The word is not working mightily in your life. And you're wondering, where is my breakthrough? I've got the answer. Dwell in the secret place. God has not abandoned you. I learned a long time ago, if the word is not working for me in my life, it's not on his end. It's on our end. Right. Are you with me this morning? If you're dwelling in the secret place, then you can expect God to deliver you from whatever you are facing. He will protect you from the chaos and destruction that's all around you. You'll not be touched by pestilences that may happen in this world because you're dwelling in the secret place and under the shadow of the Almighty. While you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. 
If you go through the floods, you shall not drown. Because God hides you in his secret place under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. When we get a true revelation of whose shadow that we're under, there's nothing impossible. Right. Nothing is impossible to those in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a true story. True story. There was a certainly a true, uh, this was certainly true of one man. Lieutenant C.H. Lightoller, L-I-G-H-T-O-L-L-E-R, Lightoller. He was second officer of the Titanic the night it sank. Lieutenant Lightoller was a Christian scientist, and a testimony of his experience appeared in the Christian Science Journal, October 1912, and even gives the pages 414 to 415. Working tirelessly to get passengers into lifeboats. You know, the Titanic song. I guess you all know that. <laughs> Lightoller was one of the last to enter the water as the Titanic was going down. He stayed and helped as many people as he possibly could get on the lifeboats. After he encountered the bitter cold of the North Atlantic, these words from Psalms 91 came to me. He said he wrote, it came to me. He wrote this in the journal. He said, it came to me, Psalms 91 came to me so distinctively that I seemed to realize their full import. He shall give his angels charge over me. Verse 11, he said he remembers verse 11, Psalm 91. He shall give his angels charge over me. It says he never doubted that it was possible for him to survive. It never crossed his mind that he wasn't going to survive. Think about that. He trusted the ability of God to save him. He never thought he wasn't going to survive. So in other words, what I got out of that is he acted out of faith and not fear. His first response was faith and not fear. He was plunged underwater several times. The suction of the sinking ship was a great threat. That's a big ship. He was plunged several times, but, a crucial, but at a crucial point, the forward funnel came crashing down. And when it came crashing down, it catapulted him some 20 feet away from the ship. This prevented him from being pulled down under with the suction. He was among about 30 survivors who floated the remainder of the night on an upturned lifeboat. They were later picked up by the Carpathia. Lightholder experienced no reaction to or effects from the bitter cold from the frigid water, which had been predicted that those who was out there would have some problems. We abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91 does not provide immunity from life's challenges, threats, tests, and trials, but it offers God protection amid those challenges. Psalm 91 didn't stop the Titanic from sinking, but Lieutenant Lightoller was protected because I believe he dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. Why do I say that? Because he said Psalm 91 came to him so distinctively. He knew what verse, when he was in a situation, the word produced for him. Because he had planted the word in his spirit. So his first response wasn't a state of fear. What are we going to do now? His first response was a state of faith. Because I have planted the word. Angels have been sent for my protection. Because he has given me, he has given angels charge over me. You have more than one angel in charge. You have more than one angel responsible to keep you in all your ways. The angels have an assignment. They have received commission from God himself to watch carefully over the faithful who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. 
Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. We abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Almighty means all powerful, omnipotent. Omnipotent means that God is always potent. That means He's always got something. Whatever you need, God's got it. Omni means always. Potent means full of power. Omnipotent means that God is potentially everything. Come on, no illusion. Now I did a message on this. I've already I, I gotta bring that back on potential. He has within him the potential for all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be. Because before God made anything, before anything was, God is. Go to Exodus chapter 3. Verse 13 and 14. Man, I'm going to have to wind this thing up. Are you enjoying it this morning? It's going to get better. Then Moses said to God, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said to God. Now this was when Moses at the burning bush. Remember when Moses gave... Uh, I mean, God gave Moses commission to go rescue people out of Egypt. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children... Now Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel... See, Moses was contemplating, Man, I got to go get the people, the slaves out of Egypt from Pharaoh? Pharaoh is considered to be the highest person on the face of the earth at that time. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them... The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? Or what shall I say to them when they ask me, what is his name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. We talked about this Wednesday night. We talked about this Wednesday night about I am, has, how about how powerful, how powerful people's names were in Egypt. And your names are powerful too. When we, when we die, we put our names on our tombstone. But names were very important, especially in the royalty arena with gods and Pharaoh. Names were very important. At this time, the Israelites' nation lived in Egypt. They were surrounded, they were slaves of Egypt, surrounded by temples dedicated to the deities with faces, bodies, some were half man, half animal, some dedicated to burst on, talking about gods, what well, they worshipped. There was false gods in Egypt at the time. Some dedicated to birth stories, death stories. Most, signific most significantly, they assumed that these gods had names and dominion over certain aspects of life. They had gods for about anything. For example... The goddess of Isis. Isis had dominion, supposedly, this was their belief, they had dominion over women, children, and medicine. Her name identified her with specific characteristics, and she held dominion over a few elements of life. That was their belief. But when God told Moses to tell them, I am sent you, I am signifies I am who I am, which in Hebrew says Aye Asher Aye, E H Y E H. That's what it says in Hebrew, which translate I will be what I will be. When God gave when God gives a name for His people to call Him, it conveys His authority and dominion over everything. I am is the source of his power. I am is therefore his eternal nature. He is the self-sufficient God who was, who is, and who will ever be. The, let me say, the slaves or the Israelites were living under the oppression of the Egyptians. 
it wasn't so much meaningful to them that God existed. Because they had been groomed and taught, there's a God for this, a God for that, a God for that. But they needed to know that God was going to be present with them. That's why God told them to tell them, I am sent me. Y'all ain't getting it. God told Moses to say to the Israelites, I am who I am has sent me. The phrase translated, I am who I am in Hebrew is Elye. E-H-Y-E-H. And Elye would be... I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> Elye would be used in, in many certain normal circumstances. In other words, it was a common language to say I am. You know what I mean? Like I am running, I am walking, I am El Shaddai, I am a God that's more than enough. Are you with me? So it was, it was normal for them to use Elye in the I am as a normal word. However... When I am is used as a standalone description. I am is the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency, self-existence, and it means immediate presence. God's existence is not contingent upon anybody else. His existence isn't contingent upon anyone. His plans are not contingent upon anybody's circumstances. He promises that he is he who he is, and he will be who he will be, and he will do what he needs to do. If you abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let me end with this. When God identified himself as I am who I am, he stated that no matter when, no matter where, and no matter what, I am there. <laughs> Let me finish with this. Turn your Bible real quickly to John chapter 8. I can't get to it. It's going to take me too while. Mm. How many were here Wednesday night? We talked about the blood of the Lamb. Lamb. You won't hear, you need to get that tape. I don't know if yeah, I might. Yeah. But anyway, let's go to John chapter 8. I'm going to read verse uh, 53. And then I'm going to jump down to 56 and 57. This was a discussion that Jesus was having with some of the Pharisees, some of the disciples. It says in verse 53. They asked him, are you, they asked Jesus this, are you greater than Father Abraham who is dead? Go to verse 56. Jesus had, was answering a question. Verse 56 says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Verse 57. When the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Verse 58. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, before Abraham was, even before Adam was, I am. He was signifying his authority. He's the God that was. He's the God that is. And he's the God that ever will be. If you believe it, stand to your feet this morning. He says, I am. Before Abraham was born. He didn't say I was. He says, I am. We got to get a hold of that. Next time life throws something at you, Know who's on your side. I am is on your side. That means there's nothing impossible with Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory.